Hello again, Gary Stearman. Welcome to another edition of Prophecy Watchers. Today's guest, author Bill Solace. Hi, Bill. Gary, it's great to be with you. Oh, it really is. You know, Bill and I have uh, sat around and had a number of very interesting discussions over the years about uh, the things that he's produced. And today, uh, we're going to drop back a step or two and revisit uh, a, a book, in fact, a series of, of uh, presentations that he's developed around Psalm 83 and the prophetic aspects of Psalm 83. And, and Bill, what I want to do today is just... Uh, sort of revisit uh, the origins of, of your work uh, in analyzing Psalm 83. There it is, uh, the Psalms. Uh, now, a lot of people have suggested the Psalms are prophetic, and they certainly are in lots of ways. And uh, a lot of people have tried to attach keys to the, to the Psalms so that they could discern what happens when and so forth. But I don't think there's a more blatant psalm in the entire set of psalms than Psalm 83. It just really lays out a situation. And before I ask what I'm going to ask in just a second, I'd like to say that Psalm 83 is a prayer. And, and I think it's a prayer for today. And, and it's an amazing prayer. And with that, Psalm 83. Absolutely. And that's a good point, Gary, about the prayer. Um, many people are actually praying Psalm 83 these days because the content of the psalm is addressing the turmoil that surrounds Israel. It's a prayer for Israel's survival and protection and deliverance. And also it concludes with the prayer for the enemies of Israel that they would get it right and understand the one true God. Mm -hmm. So it really is a, a very comprehensive, all-encompassing prayer. But where it actually gets even deeper than that is that it's actually a prophecy as well. It is written by Asaph 3,000 years ago. Now Asaph, he wrote 12 Psalms, Psalm 73 through Psalm 83, but he also wrote Psalm 50. But we find out in 2 Chronicles 29.30 that Asaph was much more than just a worship leader for King David. He was actually a prophet. It says he, he was a, a, a seer, mm -hmm. a beholder of vision, a prophet like Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So uh, what I've done in the Psalm 83 works in the book is uh, talked about the prophetic aspects of it. What does it mean? What does it say? And why is it relevant for now? Now, when Asaph begins, he says something that really is of interest to me. Verse 1 of Psalm 83 says, Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. The inference there to me is that God has been sort of quiet. God seems removed. And the psalmist is saying, show yourself, he you know, help us, because uh, we have these enemies who are coming after us, and we need help. Now, this really fits a latter-day scenario, because from our perspective, sitting here in the 21st century, it, it seems that God has been silent for a long, long time, and he's allowed Israel's enemies to just continually strengthen and and to all intents and purposes, it looks like they're going to overpower it, little tiny Israel. You know, if you, if you ask anyone today, do you think Israel can, can, come, can bounce back and become maybe the strongest uh, nation in the Middle East? Most, most people would say, no, I don't think so, because Israel's simply overpowered. And I think that's the spirit of this psalm. Well, it's a good point, Gary, because... Verse 1 and verses 9 through pretty much the rest of the psalm up through verse 18, which concludes the psalm, are petitions from Asaph to his God, to Jehovah. The details of the psalm we get are in the, in the verses between 2 and verses 8. Mm -hmm. But he starts out by petitioning to not be silent about this because he's going to refer in the details of the psalm about nothing short of a genocidal attempt on the, the Jewish people and the state of Israel. And you know, we'll get in, perhaps read a little bit to the viewers about the details mm -hmm. of the psalm. But what I find interesting is that in Bible prophecies, they are discerned when they need to be discerned. You know, we look at Daniel chapter 12, where Daniel was getting these prophecies and he's trying to understand them. And, and God told him, you know, you're not going to, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, you're not going to understand these prophecies. They're not for your generation. They're to be, they'll be unsealed at a time of the end when they're impertinent. Psalm 83 when you understand the details of it, would not have made any sense a hundred years ago. There was not even an Israel a hundred years ago. Absolutely. And so, in in fact, I, 
what, ha what was happening 100 years ago is the decline of the Arab nations. The, the last great caliphate faded from view, uh, and, and the Arabs were scattered in all directions. And, and so 100 years ago, the context wouldn't be Psalm 83's context. Right, and so Psalm 83 really had been treated much just simply as a prayer for many, many years, centuries, because it really didn't find application, never was fulfilled in the Old Testament. It mm -hmm. could not have been fulfilled between 70 AD and 1948 mm -hmm. when there was no Israel. Of course, now that there is an Israel, we're looking to this as a very vivid and active prophecy. So having it being revealed now, uh, God is not being silent. And I would just add one last thought on that first mm -hmm. verse. You know, since the uh, the works I've done have come out in 2008 and then uh, again upgraded in the, with this book in 2013, uh, <coughs> Psalm 83 has been on all kinds of major Christian television shows, internet sites, news articles, and things like this. Literally millions of people now have heard about this psalm and its prophetic implications. So the Lord has answered, verse 1, He has not kept silent. Now, let's continue. This, uh, to me, is very, a very exciting study, and, and Bill, in, in his book, Psalm 83, really brings the excitement home. The second verse says, For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. Now, the Lord has his hidden ones. He, he has his people in, in, in certain places. And, oh, if we could just know who those people are. But they're there, and they're waiting, I think, right now. And I believe he's talking about leaders of Israel here, don't you? Well, okay, now that is the one verse that has many people curious. Because it's not only talking about thy people or the nation of Israel, but these hidden ones. He's addressing yeah. actually two groups there. It's like a group within a group. Yeah. I, I just had a conversation recently with Dr. Chuck Missler. Many of your viewers, you might know who Dr. Chuck Missler is. Gary and I both know who he is, of course. And uh, he's asked me, what does that mean, that hidden ones uh -huh. or that treasured ones in some verses and some translations? And the Hebrew word is Safan, T-S-P-H-A-N, I believe that's how it's spelled. It's first usage which we always look at for biblical relevance, is when was it first used, how was it used, what was the context of it, was when Moses' mother put Moses in the basket when the firstborn males of the Hebrews were being slaughtered by Pharaoh and sailed him off down the Nile. The se so he was hidden from that. The second usage is when, um, uh, oh, come on, who am I thinking about? The, with the, hid the two spies. Um, yeah. The Rahab the harlot. Rahab, <laughs> yes. Thank you, Gary. I knew you'd know that one. <laughs> Rahab hid the two spies. That's the second usage of the word. Now, Chuck floats the idea that it could be an Old Testament allusion to the rapture. And that maybe the church would be you know, raptured at the, at the time of Psalm 83. Of course, he's a pre-trib rapture believer. We believe Psalm 83 is a pre-trib. I believe it's a pre-trib event for various reasons I allude to in my works. Um, I personally am going to tell you my thought on it. You think it might be the leadership, maybe. Uh, he thinks it might be the church concealed in the Old Testament and the rapture. Uh, I think it's dealing with the remnant. I think Moses maybe was a type of the faithful remnant, and the two spies maybe they were faithful type of the remnant. I think it could be the faithful remnant inside of the nation Israel. Currently they're hidden. They don't even know who they are yet. Perhaps the 144,000. Could be dealing with that too. So, But I'm telling you that I've studied the psalm until I'm blue in the face. And I'm that sure. is the most puzzling term right there. All right. <laughs> and now now we go to the part that I want Bill to really begin to, to hold forth upon. And verse 4 says, They have said, now these, these people that are rising against Israel, they have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, let that their name, the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance, for they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. In other words, they're joining forces to come against Israel. And now we have this list of of, uh, of people who are the, the confederacy, if you will. Tabernacles of Edom, the Ishmaelites of Moab, the Hagarines, Gabel, Ammon, Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre, Asher also joined with them. Uh, they have holpen the children of Lot, it says the King James. They have helped or aligned themselves with the children of Lot. Now you have an enemies list there. If there ever was an enemies list, this is an enemies list. It is, and those verses, uh uh, basically three through eight that you just read. Uh, it's talking about a legitimate confederacy and this very specific group that you talked about. And of course, your viewers, 
You may not know who the Edomites and the Ammonites and Moabites and them are, so we'll take a moment to kind of put them on a modern day map for you. Okay. Because, you know, when, Jer when Asaph wrote, he didn't have Palestinians and Hezbollah and ISIS and Jordanians and things like that. So it's important when we do these uh, interpretations to let people know who he could be talking about if it's for our time. But what he's clearly talking about is a specific Confederate group, a contemporary group of enemies, not a chronological ordering of Israel's en enemies throughout time. Matter of fact, Israel had many, many more enemies than the ones he's even listed there. But this group comes together, and they, it says they form a crafty plan, a devious plan, and their goal is to destroy the nation of Israel that the name of Israel can be remembered no more. They want to wipe Israel off the map. They don't want an Israel. And so it's very, very concerning, and that's why it's important to find out well, who's he talking about? That kind of thing. So we'll talk, you know, we can spend a moment on who is he talking about. Well, the first, the first one on the list is the Tabernacles of Edom. Now, you can't find anybody holding an Edomite passport today. There, as far as I know, there are no Edomites that are just out there driving around and saying, hi, I'm an Edomite. So you have to identify them somehow. Uh, and, and here it's called the Tabernacles or the Tents of Edom. Now, what, what do you make of that? Right, and that's a very good point. First, they're listed first, which when you have a coalition listed in the Bible in first position, they tend to be the star of the show, like the okay. credits at the end of a movie, the main star, and then the supporting cast comes scrolling down, that sort of thing. So something about their plight, when they're in a, a tent-like condition, which biblically would either represent military encampments or refugee conditions, mm -hmm. what it turns out, and I've done exhaustive research on this, is even though history has lost track of the Edomites, biblical prophecy keeps them right up at the forefront. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau. You know, Jacob had a twin brother named Esau. Right. Jacob was later called Israel, but Esau fathered the Edomites. We get a whole bunch of history on them in Genesis chapter 36. When you follow their migratory trails, you find out that today they have ethnical representation inside of the Palestinians, inside of the Palestinian refugees, the tents of Edom. And that's who I'm going to suggest to your viewers that we're dealing with here. And what Asaph is telling us is that when you see the Palestinians in a refugee type condition, get ready for this prophecy. Now when they go through the rest of the list of the other populations, what he's talking about there is the Arab states, I call them an inner circle that surround Israel. They share mm -hmm. common borders with Israel. They're Lebanon. Of course in Lebanon you have probably, he says the inhabitants of Tyre, I would put that as maybe even Hezbollah for a real-time application. Mm -hmm. You have Syria. Uh, he talks about Assyria, that would be Syria and Iraq. He talks uh, about, um, and of course now ISIS is in there, you know, what's going to yeah. happen with them. And then he talks about Jordan, the children of Lot, Moab and Ammon are listed. Uh, he talks about uh, the Ishmaelites, I would put that pretty much around Saudi Arabia. Uh, he was the father of the Arabs, Ishmael. He talks about the Hagarines. Hagar was Ishmael's mother. She was an Egyptian matriarch. And then he talks about Philistia, where you would have where the Hamas are right now, on the, that, the Gaza area. So they're an inner circle of nations. When I just want to make a quick comment as I conclude on this. Notice that none of those countries, for your viewers that are familiar with the other big prophecy that many of you are watching for, called Ezekiel 38, Gog of Magog, I call them an outer ring of nations because none of them are listed in Psalm 83 or vice versa. Mm. I think we have two distinctly different prophecies and the works that you're offering will point that out. Wow. So what we have here uh, is, as only the Lord could do it, as only the Holy Spirit could put th something together, we've got a very accurate description of what is taking place in the Middle East today. And, and again, we have Edom, Ishmaelites, Moab, the Hagarines, Gebel, Ammon, Amalek. Amalek, if you stop and think about it, Israel's first enemy. The people out there in the desert who were trying everything they could do to wipe out the Israelites in the early days. And their descendants are still around, apparently. Yeah, and that's a good point. I did not really mention Amalek. They are among the ten confederates. And Israel's ancient enemies, all of these, especially the Amalekites going way back, like you said, some of their very first enemies, they on a map today would pretty much be down below southern Israel, down in that Sinai and that Negev area there. And of course you've got all kinds of problems going on there with the terrorism, that the, Egypt's even concerned about the terrorists going on over there. So, you know, really it is, they've got Israel surrounded. They are the surrounding peoples. Now let's uh, move on down. Uh, the concluding uh, verses of this prayer uh, of Asaph 
really are a fascinating study for me. Uh, as Asaph is praying to God on behalf of Israel, he says, do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Jabin, at the brook Kishon, uh, which perished at Endor. They became as dung of the earth. Well, the, the man praying here now is evoking the defeat of the Midianites. He says, Lord, I want you to do to this confederation of people exactly what you did to the Midianites in the old days. And I love to read in the Old Testament the story of, of how God defeated the Midianites because, uh, among other things, he, he, he took uh, the superhero Gideon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, he didn't even want the job, did he? He didn't, want, he didn't want the job. Uh, God said, Gideon, I want you to go out and I want you to defeat the Midianites. What? Who? Me? Lord? You know, that was yeah. his reaction. Yeah. And I'd, I would be with Gideon. I mean, because I would look at the Midianite hordes and I, I'd say, I'm only one man. Well, one man with the Lord is an army, and that's what, that's the story. So here we have a prayer that a very tiny force will go out and defeat this confederacy, just like Gideon defeated the Midianites. So that sets the, the terms of this latter-day battle that you're talking about. Yeah, what's interesting, he here's where the petitioning picks up again. Verse 1 was a petition to not keep silent. Here we go again. He's, now he's petitioning God yeah. to how to, to deal with this, these oppressors. And so we have to go to this. He, he goes with Gideon. He also talks about Javan and Sisera in those verses. So when he talks about the Midianites, he is talking about Gideon. So you, he, he's drawing our attention back to some historical precedent in Hebrew history mm -hmm. that you would pick up in Judges chapters 4 through 8. J Judges chapters 6 through 8, mm -hmm. you were dealing with Gideon's story. The right. Midianites had oppressed the Israelis for seven years, and uh, Gideon was told that oppression will stop. So he mustered together his 300-man army with a little help from the tribe of Ephraim, mm -hmm. and they defeated 120,000 Midianites. And obviously, it was an empowerment of the Israeli defense forces of those times, and they were outnumbered and outmanned and outarrowed and outbowed, and you can, name, you can keep on going. And basically, it, he also talks about destroy from there the Zeba and Zamuna and Oreb and Zeb. Now, Oreb and Zeb were the princes of the Midianites who were destroyed by Gideon's men, mm -hmm. and Zeban and Zalmunna were the kings, and they were killed by Gideon himself. And so the way I would now look at that is not only were the infantry, but from all the ranks all the way up to the leadership were taken out by Gideon and his army. And we'll find out never again in history or in the Bible do you see the Midianites ever oppressing the Israelis again. Now, I think what he's saying there is that even though we might be outmanned, outgunned, mm -hmm. you know, out you know, out jetted and airplane, deal with them like you did the Midianites so that they can never oppress us again. Now, I, I want to say one last thing on that real quick, what, what I find interesting. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not hurrying you. I'm just kind of looking ahead here just a little bit as you're talking. As a good host should. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you, Bill. The, uh, what I find interesting is he does not say, deal with them like you did with Pharaoh and his armies at the Red Sea. Uh -huh. Because that was always the, the moment, the miracle that was memorialized in Hebrew history. But what we had back then was not any army. What we had was a bunch of refugees. We had no military precedent there. Uh, Moses was back to the Red Sea with a bunch of refugees. And here comes Pharaoh and his armies barreling down on them. And you know they had no means of defending themselves apart from the miracle of God and that sort of thing. Now, what Gideon, uh, what Asaph has though between then and the time he writes this song about 3,000 years ago, is some military precedent with the Canaanites. He talked about Javan and Sisera. They mm -hmm. destroyed the Canaanites who had oppressed them for 20 years and they never oppressed them again. Um, and the Midianites here. So he's saying empower the Israeli Defense Forces is what I believe he's saying there mm -hmm. to deal with the Psalm 83 Confederacy. Bill has put all this into uh, this book, Psalm 83, now which has been out since 2013, and uh, it's met great success. Uh, you've accompanied this with a couple of, uh, of DVDs, and by the way, we're uh, offering those to you today. Uh, this, we're calling it the Psalm 83 package, and you can find it right here in the Prophecy Watchers uh, online bookstore, and uh, we're offering at a very special uh, price for you today. Because I think it's something you should study. To me, it's very encouraging, Bill. I, uh, 
as you can tell, I'm excited about this when I, when I go through this psalm. What it says to me is, uh, in the natural reasoning process, there's no way Israel can go against all the armies uh, of the Mideast, against Russia, uh, against maybe Europe. Who knows who's going to flood into the Middle East? But reasoning from the spiritual, uh, there's no way Israel can lose. And that's exactly what what's being said here. Exactly what Gideon had to face. And even uh, Deborah and Barak at the time of the Canaanites that he also talks about. Yeah, it, only God could get them through. And let's look at the example of 1948. You know, here yeah. comes ragtag refugees out of the Holocaust. And immediately this very countries in Psalm 83 come against them. Some people actually thought it was a fulfillment of Psalm 83 in 1948. Mm. And they had fighter jets, and is, the Israelis had a few private planes and a few hand grenades, right. and, and they won that war. That was a David and Goliath story. That was a Gideon Midianite story. Uh, very much we're watching this in real time in modern history. And uh, also, also Bill has uh, accompanied uh, the book w with a couple of DVDs, which I'd like for you to talk about. Uh, uh, what are the contents of the DVDs, and how would they help the studies? Well, the first DVD actually came out with the book in 2013. It was professionally produced. It inc incorporates three PowerPoint presentations that give you a very comprehensive look at three important topics that are inside of the book. They've got maps, images, lines of force, the things we've been talking about. We chart who are these Edomites and Ammonites and Moabites. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of visuals in here. And one is, what is, what's next? Psalm 83 or Ezekiel 38? Two big prophecies to be watching for. Two, what's next? The future for America and Bible prophecy. Is America in the Bible? And three, the roots of the Middle East conflict, what believers need to know. Why can't anyone figure out what's going on with this ancient hatred in the Middle East? Why is it going to climax in a concluding mm -hmm. Psalm 83 Arab-Israeli war? That's that DVD. And then okay. we came out with this one uh, about a year later. And this is America's role in Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38. America's role in the coming mini wars. Americans, Gary, you know, they're wondering what's going to happen yes. with these wars coming. How will that adversely affect And us sadly, here? Bill, let me just interrupt. By, and here's a, a thought from me personally, but I'm sure it reflects uh, some thoughts you've had out there too. And that is, America seems to be pulling away from support for Israel. Oh, it's, it's, and, yeah. and, and so Israel is left without help which may, may be a part of this whole prophecy, that when it looks like Israel can't possibly go any further, that's when God steps in and, and works these wonders. You know, Gary, you and I have been studying prophecy a long time, and you much longer than I have. And uh, I, I think we can both say Israel has never been more isolated in the international community than right now, and yet at the worst time. with Right. Uh, the weapons that are pointed at them could wipe Israel off the map. Of course, that's the motive of Psalm 83. Yes. We haven't even talked about Iran. Um, they oh. they want to wipe Israel off the map, and they're about to have a nuclear weapon if the way at the pace they're going. So, Israel is oh. in a is a in a real cauldron right now. Now, do you see Iran, uh, the Iranians, in any way in Psalm 83? Uh, I don't see them there. They would have been listed under Media, Elam, or Persia. Okay. Well, but. There's no shortage of information about Iran's future in Bible prophecy. And as a matter of fact, um, I hope we can talk about Elam, which is another prophecy that's been vastly overlooked. And by, we're going to devote an entire other program to that. Oh, so fantastic. That is, we're going to have a long time to, to spend you know, elucidating the idea of what is biblical Elam. Let me do something here. This psalm concludes with a statement. <clears throat> After it prays, for a victory over the enemy, verse 18 has a, it's a tagline, as we would say in modern English, but, but it really is a punchline. And, and the bottom line of this prayer is that, the, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high God over all the earth. In other words, that's why... Asaph is praying. He says, I want men to know that your name and your name alone is the name of God. And we have here in the King James Version, in all caps, Jehovah spelled out. Now, there's another word that's going around today. Uh, it's Allah that everybody is, uh, you, you know, uttering. That's the name of the one true God. In the Middle East, uh, they're, in fact, persecuting Christians now, making them uh, pledge uh, to Allah or be killed in a lot of cases. 
And so we have this battle, what's God's real name? And the prayer here is, here is that men may know uh, that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. Bottom line, Bill. Well, uh, Asaph makes that point clear. There's no identity crisis here as to who's the one true God. It's Jehovah, his God, the God of the Bible, the God who sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, to die for our sins so that we could have eternal life that none would perish. And I really like the way it concludes because you and I have talked about prophecy so many times at conferences yeah. and other media scenarios. And basically, we always try to bring it down to this very point. And this is the perfect uh, uh, conclusion to his psalm. Is it's, it's not about the scary prophecies and the doom and gloom. God's just trying to give us information through the prophets to bring it down to the fact that God loves us. He is the one true God. And we the theme that's central in end times Bible prophecy is that there will be... Uh, these, some of these populations, there will be an Israeli remnant that recognizes Jesus as the Lord. There will be Assyrians, there will be Jordanians, there will be Egyptians. We'll, in our next program we'll even talk about there will be Iranians that come to know. And many of them are coming to know the Lord right now. But unfortunately, many of them won't come to know the Lord until after they go through Psalm 83 and these other prophecies and the tribulation period and things like that. So what we do when we, when we do these programs is we reach out to you right now. We reach right to, to you whether you're a, a Jewish person or an Arab or a Persian or just an American. There is no divide, ethnic or racial or anything between the love of God for you right now. And that's what Asaph is trying to tell you, that you may know the one true God. And don't put this decision off right now. It's a gift of salvation that you must receive. And, and this is what Bible prophecy should do. We should thank God that he has put this information in front of us. And our natural response for this information will, is invaluable for us for the days in which we live is to thank him and love him and worship him. Mm, well said. Uh, Jehovah, right at the end uh, of this psalm. You know, Bill, we live in an, in an era just uh, in the last minute or so here when people use the word God and uh, there's a common idea. You pray to your God, I pray to my God, we all pray to God. Uh, you may be praying to a little different God than I pray to, but so we're all one around the world because we're all using the name God. And this last verse of Psalm 83 just shoots that idea down completely, utterly. And John 14, 6, you know, this was a very bold statement back when it was made 2,000 years ago by Jesus, and it applies right now, and it's even bolder right now because there's a menu of gods. You can have a different god every day of the calendar. Hindu gods, Allah, you name it. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one gets to the Father but through me. And if you believe that, you want to put your trust in him. Gary and I believe that with all of our hearts. Bill, well said. And, and uh, by the way, you should avail yourself of Bill's study here in Psalm 83, the Psalm 83 package. You can see right on your screen how to get it. I'm Gary Stearman. Thanks for joining us. And keep watching, everybody.